How do I feel when my website and applications come under attack? Thanks to Newstar Security, I feel confident. Their full ultra-secure suite of always-on cloud security services enables me to be confident that our website will always be available to our customers whenever they need it. Newstar Security does more than ensure my company's online presence is ultra-secure. It ensures my peace of mind. Newstar Security. Always on. Ultra-secure. Welcome to the Oh Hell No podcast, where I, Keisha Nicole, delivers a daily dose of passion, purpose, and struggle by interviewing people who are living their best life doing what they love. Here on this podcast, every Oh Hell No moment serves a purpose. Now let's get started with the show. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Paul Moore. He is an entrepreneur, an author, and a podcaster, and he's successful at all three of these things. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Thank you for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yes. So um, I'm going to go through the journey of your life and kind of ask you questions that's going to kind of paint the picture for um, my listeners. Okay. So the first thing is what motivated you to get an engineering degree? Stupidity. <laughs> I didn't know myself at all. And I didn't, I, you know, I, I got great grades in physics, chemistry, biology, all these sciences and, and math. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I didn't know myself. I thought it made sense to get something really technical. Now, if I would have known myself, I would have got a degree in marketing or maybe business of some kind because, or, or even writing, because I, I love writing as well. But nobody, I'm not blaming anybody but myself, but I just didn't have any good guidance. And so, uh, you know, though I did really well, I was near the top of my class in engineering. I, it wasn't what I was supposed to do, and now I can clearly see that. Wow, that's pretty interesting. So what told you that opening a staffing company was the right move? How did that happen? You know, it just fell into my lap. So I was at Ford Motor Company in Detroit, and my business partner and I, who both went to school together, we both went to Ford together, we... Um, found ourselves in a place where we were both sort of bored at Ford. And um, we uh, started looking for side ventures. And the more we looked, the more we, uh, you know, just got frustrated with, you know, how hard it was to start a business on the side. And he was able to stumble, I guess you could say, into this business because uh, his father, was, his father-in-law was friends with the CEO. And so... He got to know the CEO of this company. He ended up opening a division uh, in, for this company. And then I opened another division, and then we broke away and started our own company after a while. Wow. So how did you like that industry? So it was a PEO, professional employer organization. We took care of people's payroll taxes, benefits, workers' comp, um, gave employees great uh, payroll check. I mean, we gave them their payroll checks, but we also gave them great benefits. And we gave, you know, employees from a two and three and 10 person company, the benefits of a 500 person company, because we combined them all together. So it was really satisfying to know we were doing something good for the company and the employees. And so, yeah, it was great. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Because when you when it said I read staffing company, I'm thinking like, uh, um, you know, a temp agency or something like that you know so it we say staffing because it's easiest to explain but when i really dig into it yeah it's not it's it's a human resource management company right wow so you ended up selling that company and mm -hmm. who buys a company like that believe it or not it was the same company that my friend went to work for originally because they got very successful they went public and when they went public, they uh, decided they wanted to acquire a company in Detroit. And they were based in Columbus. And so we uh, were able to, um, to sell our company to them. 
Okay, so after you sold that company, that was a pretty nice lump sum of money that you received, huh? Yeah, it was. I mean, for a 33-year-old to, you know, to be splitting $2.9 million with a friend was pretty fun. Oh, my God. That sounds so amazing. <laughs> so um, after you did that, did you immediately go into real estate? No, I actually started an international student ministry in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. I, I found out that like 85% of uh, international students who came to America, one of their big goals was to uh, meet uh, American families, spend time in Americans' homes, and but 85% of them, maybe 90 even, had never set foot in an American's home in five years of school in America. And so what we did is we got five families together, we bought 120 acres on top of a Blue Ridge Mountain, and we set up a sort of an informal retreat center where we these international student groups could come and bring their students, you know, from Asia or uh, wherever, South America or Russia, and they would bring their students and they would get to milk a goat and ride a cow or sometimes ride a goat and milk a cow and get to pet a horse, ride horses, go fishing in a pond, stay in Americans' homes. And this was a big treat for us and for them. And we did that for about two or three years. The problem was there wasn't enough activity to keep me busy. And I was a, by then I was a 34, 35 year old, highly driven entrepreneur and I got bored again. And so that's when I got into flipping real estate. Wow. So, um, you do like big developments. So I want to know like what kind of money goes into developing a waterfront subdivision? One of the uh, subdivisions we did was I, I helped my friend with was 121 lots. And I think that was in North Dakota. It wasn't waterfront. And I think we had it, land in North Dakota was really cheap. So I think we only had maybe a million dollars in the land. And uh, we, we didn't do the full development. We just platted it out, got it approved by the city and sold it. And we made a nice profit and I think we sold it for maybe two and a half million so we more than doubled our money and we didn't have to do any of the really hard work the waterfront subdivision I did at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia it was five acres and um, we cut it into five one acre lots and so I think we had 830,000 in it sold it in the depth of the 2008-2009 recession for I think it was like 1.3 million for the five lots Wow. So how do you manage to always meet the right people and get into the right rooms and, you know, make the right decisions? What do you think that comes from? Great question. So, you know, if you were living up north and you wanted to live off salmon, this sounds really weird, Nicole, but trust me, I'll get there. If you were living up north on salmon and you were trying to be, you know, you really wanted to um, enjoy uh, salmon, uh, you could become a spear fisherman. Now, if you became a spear fisherman, you'd have to learn to carve the, um, you know, you'd have to learn to carve the uh, stick. You'd have to learn to throw the spear. You'd have to, you know, figure out how to hit a, hit a salmon and then, you know, reel it in. And um, it would be pretty hard. And you might get some fish, you might be able to live off that salmon, but it'd be pretty hard. However, if you really want to do well, now this is where the analogy is really silly. The analogy is that um, we, uh, you could also be a bear in the waterfall. And if you want to be a bear in the waterfall, then what you would do is you would just go stand in the waterfall and unhinge your jaw and let salmon jump into your mouth. Now you probably wonder what the heck I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this. If you want to be some, if you want to meet the right people, you need to become a subject matter expert. You need to be like the bear in the waterfall and let people come to you. You don't want to go out selling people. You don't want to go chasing deals and people and investors. You want them to come to you and the way to get them to come to you would be to actually um, get them to 
uh, you, you raise a flag, you become a subject matter expert, and then they flock to you like salmon coming to a bear accidentally in a waterfall. And so that's what our policy has been with our company. And we just put out the best content we can and um, we, uh, we expect people to come to us, and they do every day. People come to us asking us questions, asking for advice, even asking if they can invest with us. And by the way, I noticed I called you by your middle name, Nicole. Sorry, Keisha. No, it's fine. I started this podcast as Nicole. <laughs> so okay. It's all good. Um, so for you, when you were starting out, though, and you know you wanted to just do these different things and you weren't a subject matter expert what 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 did you do to kind of put yourself in the right places or do you think that that just happened organically for you you know originally with the staffing company i just had to really really work hard i had to get make i had to lose my fear of man i had to make you know difficult phone calls i had to go to all kinds of meetings i didn't want to go to i had to shake all kinds of hands and it was just hard and i had to pursue them if i would have known about this principle of being a subject matter expert you know i would have done everything i could to have people come to me mm, interesting so share some struggles with us what is the most expen um, expensive mistake you have ever made and how did you come back from it and what did you learn? One of the most expensive mistakes was that waterfront subdivision I told you about. Now, you already know the end of the story, unfortunately. But <clears throat> what happened is we were buying waterfront lots at this resort, Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. And we bought this one five-acre tract, and we were speculating. Now, Keisha, investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal, your investment, is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And that was the situation I found myself in. And so the way we speculated on that is we were tr counting on the county to make the gravel road there mm -hmm. into a state-maintained road. And the county and the state had to approve that where they didn't. And so I couldn't divide that into the five one-acre lots. It had to stay a five-acre lot. So I was in big trouble. And this went on for like two years. And I was paying massive amounts of interest on this loan. I think it was an $800,000 loan. I'm not sure. And so um, we were falling into this. You know, it was exactly 10 years after I had a million and a half dollars in the bank. Uh, I found myself two and a half million dollars in debt. And it was um, the fall of 2007. We knew the financial crisis was upon us, the real estate crisis. We didn't know how bad it was going to get, of course. We were hoping the worst was over. Boy, were we wrong. And um, <clears throat> so I actually, uh, I have a hero named George Mueller. Now, George Mueller was a pastor. He was, he was a hellion originally in Germany. And he went and became a pastor in England, and he actually raised something like a quarter to half a billion dollars in today's U.S. dollars to care for 10,000 orphans over the course of his lifetime in Bristol, England. And he did it all by prayer and faith. He didn't actually, um, he didn't actually put the word out that he needed any money at all. It just came to him. And so I thought, well, what would George Mueller do if he was two and a half million dollars in debt and stuck with all this waterfront property, including this five acres? And I thought, well, he would do something outrageous, like begin to give his way out of debt. So I announced to my friends and family that I was going to start giving our way out of debt, which was a crazy idea. I knew it. And so we started giving pretty outrageously. And when we were giving, we uh, just had this expectation that this was all going to work out. Well, about four weeks into giving this fairly high amount per week to you know nonprofits, charities, church, etc., I had this outrageous light bulb idea that I took to the County Planning and Zoning Commission. When I told them about it, the lady shook her head and kind of shamed me a little. She was like, "I can't believe you would have such an idea," but then she laughed. She said, but you know what? You found a loophole in the law. You can subdivide this five acres and nobody can stop you. And um, so I did. 
and we were able, like I told you, to sell it for 1.3 million, and we worked really hard over the next year, but within 13 months, by spring of 20, uh, 2009, I should say, we were completely debt-free, and we completely paid off our house as well. Wow, that's pretty amazing. It is. Yeah. Um, so share with us what you think the secrets are used by the super wealthy to attain and maintain their wealth over generations. A friend of mine in California had been involved in commercial real estate for a number of years. And he said, I could show somebody, a wealthy family, how to take $20 million, invest it for 10 years and not touch any of the profits. At the end of 10 years, uh, begin taking cash flow from the commercial real estate investments. And he said, at the end of 20 years, they will have made $131 million in profit, and their portfolio will be worth $210 million. I was completely blown away by this, but I was even more shocked when he said, and the most amazing part is, they may not have to pay any taxes along the way. I said, how could that be? And he said, well because when you get into commercial real estate, you'll realize there are tax loopholes that the government has set up that they allow to allow people who invest in commercial real estate to navigate without paying a lot of tax. There's sometimes tax due later, but often it's kicked way down the road or maybe never paid. And so um, the way to do it is through commercial real estate. There's no other tax there's no other um, asset class that I know of that has as low a risk, as high a return, and as high a tax benefits as commercial real estate. Mm, very interesting information. Mm -hmm. So why did you leave real estate to establish two commercial real estate investment funds? Yeah, you know, I found that the older I got, the more risk averse I got, the more I hated risk. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, investing, uh, a, a famous person who won a Nobel Peace Prize, Paul Samuelson, said, investing should be more like watching grass grow or watching paint dry. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. And I think the point of that is, you know, the more I saw how hard it was to invest well, <clears throat> and the, the more I didn't want to be a speculator anymore, I wanted to invest and the more I learned about investing, the more I realized you have to have really, um, really good operators. And I wasn't a good operator. I'm just going to be real with you. I'm not a kind of person who's going to be a great operator. So I decided we'd be better off to set up a fund, create a lot of content, raise money, and then we invest in those great operators. So that's what we do. And we give our friends, family, and other investors a chance to invest alongside of us. Wow. That sounds easy, but I'm sure it's a lot more involved, right? <laughs> it's actually a lot of fun because we're doing the uh, bear at the waterfall thing where we're creating a lot of content. People are coming to us every day asking to invest and we just let them invest alongside of us. Oh, okay. So, on social media, there are people constantly selling this dream of how to make six figures in six months or, you know, you I can teach you how to, I made all this money in this amount of months. I can teach you how to do it. What advice would you give to someone who was about to click the buy button on an ad like that? Well, you know, you get what you pay for. I mean, we had to work really hard to get where we are. Um, we've put in thousands and thousands of hours of being mentored and trained and reading and listening to podcasts and audiobooks. And so if someone's offering you a shortcut, I would say it's often either illegal or not true, usually not true. And I think that if your gut, here's what I would say. If your brain is telling you to do this, but there's a gut check down inside of you saying don't do it, that's probably, you probably really, really need to listen to your gut because our um, our minds and, our, and our, our brains are so powerful. And, I, and I'm saying my mind now, I'm including my gut check in this. They're so powerful and they can give us clues and signals and all kinds of things that we can't really grasp with our conscious mind. And that's where our subconscious comes in. 
<clears throat> that's where that gut check comes in. It's really important to not ignore that. Every, well, I can't say every single time, but every time I ever remember in my whole 56 years that I ignored my gut and followed my brain or my greed, I lost. Mm, I love that. And I love that you keep saying that you worked hard because I think in today's society, people tend to forget to say that you have to work hard to achieve, you know, whatever it is that you want. Like, it just doesn't come like that, you know? But mm -hmm. everything seems to be so microwave, you know, microwavable here. It's like this generation of, oh, you can get this really fast. This can happen for you. You can do this. But it's just not, it's not right. <laughs> it's absolutely not right. Yeah. So you have a podcast. It's called How to Lose Money. Why would you want to tell anyone how to lose money? <laughs> Why indeed? Well, let me tell you. I For years, I would go to these conferences, and I would be there, and they, the, the speakers would be telling their, you know, I would guess, true stories about all the wonderful things they had done, all their accomplishments, and all the money they'd made, and all their success. And I would look around the people around my breakout table or my small group or whatever, and they would be kind of slumping down in their chairs, and men and women would be like, ah, oh, I'll never be that lucky. I'll never be that fortunate. I'll never have that kind of success. I'll never make millions like that. So I would say, you know, I, I would think to myself, gosh, it's too bad these people don't share their struggles they just share their successes and it was one conference in particular i went to seven years straight that this was prevalent they only shared their successes all the time mm -hmm. well i got to know some of those people at that conference some of the speakers and i actually got to know some of the speakers later as i became one myself and i realized they had the same fears same insecurities same pains same losses in fact, they had lots of failures along the way. And I thought, wouldn't it have been nice if these speakers would have shared their pain and failures and struggles along the way, not just their successes? If they would have, people could have been a lot more encouraged and they could have been filled with something that's a rare commodity, Keisha, and that is hope. Everybody needs hope. And when they realize that these famous people had the same problems along the way they are having right now, they could have hope and realize they could get through it. And that's what I want to share on the How to Lose Money podcast. And we do it every week. I love that. Absolutely love that. Thanks. So what would you say has been your greatest self-discovery? You know, um, I just decided as a young person that I couldn't speak. I, I, I found out I could write pretty well. But I found out I couldn't speak. And so um, I, I, you know, I did the speech class and I, I, I probably got an A or B, but I mean, I just really was really hard for me. So anytime I could get in a situation where I did, could write and not speak, I would. Well, when I got thrust into this bear at the, you know, grizzly bear at the waterfall role and had to start speaking on podcasts as my, on my own, which we've done over 200 and then as a guest on others, and that we've done over 150 of those, I realized, hey, I can do this. And I realized, you know, a lot of things that we think we can't do, they're all in our head. You know, quantum physics shows us that, well, I'm not going to get into this, Keisha, actually, it's just too <laughs> deep, and I'm not even able to, to summarize it. But I, I will say quantum physics shows us that there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we can't see and there's a lot, of, we have a lot of control over our outcome of our life by what we believe, number one, and but number two, what we speak. What we say is very important. Mm. Yeah, I keep hearing that, so it's got to be true. Yeah. <laughs> so tell my listeners who have just started adulting and are realizing the harsh realities of the working world what they should be focused on. You know... I wrote an article for Bigger Pockets, which is an online commercial real estate, residential and commercial real estate uh, website. It's got about 1.6 million users now, I think. And it was, you know, how to be a billionaire in three easy steps. And it was, you know, sort of tongue in cheek. 
But the way Bill Gates uh, became a billionaire is he did, number one, he figured out what he wanted to do as a very young man, as a teenager, and he stuck with it. Some people might be 30. That's fine. doesn't matter how old you are. Wherever you are, figure out what you want to do the rest of your life and stick with it. By the way, saying yes to one thing means saying no to 10,000 distractions along the way. And that's what I failed at through my 30s and 40s. I was chasing shiny objects, and that's why I didn't get focused. But that's another story. So Bill Gates knew he wanted to do computers and computer programming software development, number one. Step two, find the biggest, most successful, wealthiest company or organization that will allow you to partner with them. Okay? And so for me, well, for Bill Gates, I should say, that was IBM. Microsoft was nothing. But Microsoft partnered with IBM and said, look, we're going to create the software for you. And when they did that, IBM said yes, and that was a huge step forward for Microsoft. And then step three is something that people wouldn't expect. And by the way, for me, that was Bigger Pockets. I partnered with Bigger Pockets and said, I'll do everything I can for them. And then step three is that. Serve them with all your heart. Do everything you can to make that big company successful. Keep a servant's heart and keep trying to serve them. And then when you make them successful, often you'll become very successful in the process. And Bill Gates became the wealthiest man in the world uh, by doing that exact strategy. Now, for me, that means every chance I can, I talk to bigger pockets about how I can serve them, how I can help them with their goals, how I can help them be more successful. And when I do that, it really helps me too. Nice. So for my listeners who have been adulting for a while and are starting to wonder, well, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? I feel like I've been working for 20 years and I just want to do something that's more meaningful. What advice would you give them about making that transition? Well, maybe this is overly simplistic, but I would go on YouTube and look for a... Um, a, po a podcast or a, more of a YouTube video by Dr. Lance Wallnau. That's L-A-N-C-E-W-A-L-L-N-A-U. And Dr. Lance Wallnau talks about how everything comes together and it, once you can evaluate your strengths, your weaknesses, your losses, your failures, your education, your connections, your contacts, your family history, all of it can come together. And once it comes together in one spot, you can all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, it's really clear what I need to do with the rest of my life. And you can do that through going through that process that, um, that Lance Wall now takes people through. And so that's what I would do. I would really, I would definitely include journaling in your morning routine because you can learn so much. Because deep down inside everybody, you know much more. Your brain has picked up much more than you consciously know. Journaling can bring that out. And so um, that's what I'd recommend. Nice. So this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So now I'd like you to share an Oh Hell No moment that has taught you something or changed your perspective on something? Yeah, you know, um, I really believe because I didn't grow up with as a money manager, I didn't grow up managing my money and my parents didn't manage their money well, uh, that I would just kind of have to just be, uh, I would just be, have to, I'd have to be in the same pattern that they did. I'd have to follow in their footsteps, you know? And I really believed that for many, many years. In fact, that two, that million and a half dollars I had in my bank when I was 33 or 34, um, it mostly evaporated. And um, I had to go back and make that money a couple more times before I realized, wait a minute, I don't have to be a slave to my childhood. I don't have to be a slave to what my parents and grandparents did. I can learn to do this. And so that's what I did. And I recommend that everybody you know, try to figure out what that thing is holding them back, what that lie is. Tell that lie to go back where it came from and, 
you know, jump in and realize you have much, much more potential to do much more than you ever dreamed. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the Oh Hell No podcast. Please tell us where we can keep up with you and purchase your book and just, you know, listen to your podcast. We want to know it all. All right. So I've got a book called The Perfect Investment. It's about multifamily, which is apartment investing. And you can get that uh, under Paul Moore, The Perfect Investment, Amazon. Uh, you can also go to my website, wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S-C-A-P-I-T-A-L, wellingscapital.com. Amazing. And then your podcast is available on all platforms, right? Yeah, it's on all platforms. It's the How to Lose Money podcast, and it's howtolosemoney.com. Great. Thank you so much. Right now, you need dependable internet and endless entertainment. Xfinity has you covered with reliably fast speeds and advanced security included with the XFi Gateway, so your connected devices are protected. And when it comes to TV, Xfinity is your home for all your streaming apps, like Peacock. Plus, get contactless service visits and equipment drop-off. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Switch to Xfinity for reliable internet and access to your favorite apps right on your TV. To schedule your free contactless delivery, visit Xfinity.com or call 1-800-XFINITY. Restrictions apply. Right now, you need dependable internet and endless entertainment. Xfinity has you covered with reliably fast speeds and advanced security included with the XFi Gateway, so your connected devices are protected. And when it comes to TV, Xfinity is your home for all your streaming apps, like Peacock. Plus, get contactless service visits and equipment drop-off. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Switch to Xfinity for reliable internet and access to your favorite apps right on your TV. To schedule your free contactless delivery, visit Xfinity.com or call 1-800-XFINITY. Restrictions apply.